Elliot, you want to begin? Sure. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this podcast on sex with seniors, which is a topic uh, most dear to me because uh, I'm the most senior person here. I'm 71 years old. And we're fortunate tonight to have an expert and, and on the andropause. Dr. Greenleaf is going to start, be the first one to speak. But in general, you know, the problem is enormous. It's 70% 71, 70 of men by age 70 have, have erectile dysfunction. It's a time when diseases truly become pandemic, diabetes, hypertension that impacts sexual health. Uh, and then it's also a time of um, when men, men become more physically feeble and they have the anxieties that go along with that as well. There are a lot of therapies that are, are new that are recommended for this. Um, shockwave therapy, penis pumps, hormone therapies. So um, Dr. Greenleaf, over to you. Tell us, yeah. tell us about the cause, what it is and what can be done about it, especially from the hormone perspective. Yeah, it was so funny. I was just having a conversation about this earlier today, and I mentioned the word andropause, and somebody was like, wait, wait, what is that? I'm like, well, have you ever heard of menopause in women? And they're like, yeah. And I said, well, it's kind of like menopause, but for men. So, uh, and that's really where the word came out of. Um, and I always joke, I'm like, the word pause doesn't mean like anything's getting put on pause. It's it's a transition in life. And I think like in the United States, I would love to come up with some new terminology or in English um, to really discuss this transition. For women, it's a little bit more of an abrupt transition where they stop to get their period. But men, it can start happening well really actually as early in as in their 30s they start to decrease with their testosterone levels and so testosterone is one of the main hormones men have all the hormones that women have too they just testosterone is one of their main hormones and we start to see a decrease in the 30s and where now all of a sudden men start hitting their 40s and it becomes very drastic. And so that low testosterone can start showing up in different ways. Like one of the biggest things that we'll hear from men is like I'm working out and it's just not you know, not doing the same as like when I was 18, like I'm working out, I'm trying to eat right. And I'm just getting flabby. It's that typical, you know, we hear men talking about having the dad bod. And because what ends up happening is they have this decline in testosterone and some conversion into estrogen, we get a little bit higher levels of estrogen. So, and this affects other than just, and we'll get into how it affects sexual function, but from a body composition standpoint, it's really going to affect muscle because we need a combination of testosterone and we need a combination of eating healthy proteins and doing strength training to add muscle all together. Um, interesting enough too, that lowering testosterone is, is directly correlated with actually having cardiovascular events and having what's called morbidity, a higher risk of disease, and even a higher risk of mortality and death. So low testosterone is directly correlated with that. Um, and just as an interesting fact, they found that I'm not so sure about Australia because I know we have a friend here from Australia. It's probably flipped. But in a North American study, they found that men in North America, their testosterone is the highest in September. August and September, and the lowest in February as a seasonal change. Um, but it's in that February where we, that low testosterone, where we see the higher rates of, of death related to low testosterone. But, um, you know, we also need testosterone for sex drive. You know, it's not the, and interesting enough, a lot of people will start coming in and saying like their sex drive is low or their libido is low. And they're like, well, they, they think that testosterone is the only answer. It's it's, it's a definitely a, a tool and it's a factor that can help with with sex drive, but it's not the only thing because there's a lot of other other factors that go into sex drive. So, Elliot, I don't want to I don't want to hog up because I could go for out and hours for this. So then stop me. <laughs> I mean, one, one one thing that comes to mind immediately uh, is th does frequency of sex have an impact uh, on testosterone? In other words. If, if if men are having sex frequently, will it will they sustain a testosterone that we tend to associate level that we tend to associate with younger men? It can. Not. It's still going to naturally decrease, and even even in women, we get a natural de decreasing with age of testosterone. But um, but definitely, 
when it comes to everything with hormones or even genital organs, if you don't use it, you lose it. So that is definitely that, that the more sex you have, the more you're likely to have better erectile function, better penile function and better hormones. So, um, well, what about, yeah. what about the role of oxytocin in men? Yeah. So, well, oxytocin is really important because it's one of the relaxation. It's, it's used for, well, it's produced during sex for relaxation. It's also that bonding hormone. And so, so many of the disease states that we see nowadays are directly related to stress. And we know that when, when the body's stressed from either illness or from psychologic stress, that it will actually suck away our sex hormones because sex and stress can't coexist. So when we, when those hormones in a stress state, those sex hormones will be converted into stress hormones, which now add to further problems with inflammation in the body and further problems with disease states and um, potentially early death. So the act of having sex will boost oxytocin, which will also help with relaxation, which then kind of pushes okay. that, that pathway more right. into the sex hormones. Betsy, if you could write a prescription for men, would it be have sex once a day, twice a day, yeah. once a week, twice a week? I would say at least at least at least once a day would be great. So, but <laughs> don't tell my husband this. So it doesn't, <laughs> wait, it doesn't have to be partnered sex. So let me preface that it doesn't have to be partnered sex. It can be you know having some sort of sexual um, stimulation, whether it's with a partner or with oneself. Um, daily would be perfect, but you know, it's just like, you don't want to, you know, you can't exercise once a month and expect to be fit. So, you know, the more we exercise, the better fit, you know, the better shape we're in. So same thing, the more sex that we're having or, you know, self-pleasuring, the more likely things are going to be, are going to be healthy. But if you, if, if you are a person that has like not had sex in a long time, don't all of a sudden tomorrow start having like sex or, or, you know, self-pleasuring every single day, because the same thing, like, you wouldn't start an exercise routine where you went from like nothing to like doing it like, you know, daily. So you got to kind of build up to that too. Well, also we're talking about smooth muscle function versus skeletal muscle function. So yeah, uh, you can get, you know, you know, the gym exercise skeletal muscles. But you can't go to the gym and exercise smooth muscles unless it's a very special kind of gym. I have some yeah, of yeah. gyms down there, down in Australia, I believe, Melissa. Um, they're legal. But uh, but Betsy, get, let's get, get back to oxytocin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was asked a question about it. And, and, and Melissa made a point. I, it, what I hear from our customers, and we're really talking about an N of three, because um, that they have not found oxytocin to be effective. Uh, what has been your. Oh, ta as taking it as a supplement? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, taking it as like a hormone replacement, I think it's kind of hit or miss. Um, it does kind of give people that schmoopy feeling like, so I always tell people if you're, you know, if you have like, a, you want to make sure you really like your partner because you can, it can cause you to be bonded to somebody you might not necessarily like, because it gives you that, like, it doesn't necessarily like, put people in the mood, but it does cause some relaxation. It does cause that little schmoopy, like, I love you. No, I love you. No, I love you more type of response. Um, so, and it also can be, you know, sometimes, um, well, with any of the hormones, even things like testosterone, you can give somebody testosterone. It doesn't necessarily give them a sex drive. So, because we got to look at all the other factors that are going in, like what is their stress level? What's their inflammatory level? Um, if those things aren't under con control, all the testosterone in the world is not going to, you know, unfortunately it's, it's not, we don't have as much as people get annoyed. Like I, my female patients get annoyed with Viagra. They go, it's not fair. Men have Viagra. And I'm like, Viagra is not a horny pill. We don't have one of those yet because everybody's, your brain is your biggest, your most important sex organ. Everybody's brain is different. So we don't have a pill that necessarily turns you on, but Viagra is a blood flow pill and blood flow is so incredibly important for both all genders, all, you know, for pelvic health, because 
We need that constant blood flow into the penis to keep a penis healthy and to keep it um, in a working erectile you know, function. We need it for women for the same thing, for clitoral function, for vulvar function. You know, if we're not getting constant blood flow from sex or stimulation, it's, it's you know, it's, you, you don't use it, you lose it. It's going to go away. So... But we, what um, we see, oh. uh, let's, I'll make one point because 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 we, we actually have data because of the, we, you know, we, yes. because of the testing. So what we, what we've seen, um, what been reported to us by, you know, by customers is that, um, you, t you take, and again, these numbers are small because I don't speak to everyone. This, this is based on maybe about a dozen people is that you take men in the low normal range testosterone, uh, only some are going to respond with, with, uh, more nocturnal erections, with nocturnal erections that, that last longer. Or, or with 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 harder you know harder sex directions, so I suspect there's a receptor problem here as well too. That the, the response is 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 due, is due to a variable receptor problem. Um, Melissa, go uh, go ahead. Make I was just going to say about the oxytocin, like I've found in my patient cohort for anorgasmia, um, I prescribe it compounded one puff up each nose um, daily, and I think. It, the stats that I've seen is one in three people. So when I prescribe it, I say to patients, it works for one in three people. And when you think about that, statins only work for one in three people and, you know, they get prescribed every day. So, and whether or not that's actual or whether that's placebo, I think it really doesn't matter as long as the person feels like they're, you know, relaxed enough or they think they've taken something that helps them have an orgasm or whatever it is, if for one in three people it assists with anorgasmia then I think it's worth a try and um, a good example I had a patient who's a retired gynecologist last year and post getting his prostate out he was like oh I'm just having such a hard time having an orgasm and I suggested this to him and he kind of like scoffed at me and then was like I've got nothing to lose and he tried it came back eight weeks later and he was like well he said, I am having orgasms easier. I'm sure it's in my mind. And he said, but my wife said I'm much nicer to live with. I'm yes. much gentler. So that kind of feeds into what you're saying, Betsy. And his, apparently his wife said it would have been so nice if you had have taken this when you were working. You would have been much nicer. So yeah. it's a bit of a happy hormone as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I I, uh, I I've actually I have some interest in trying it and and, and was speaking with a, with a doctor Charlin who who, use, who uses it to treat men with Parkinson's who have erectile dysfunction. He uses a combination of sildenafil and oxytocin. He says with success. And unpublished data, but that, you know that that's part, you know, part of his routine because men with Parkinson's have significantly higher anxiety levels um, and often take often often taking dopamine dopamine dopaminergic medications. That you know, treat the Parkinson's that that make it harder for them to get erections, but also make it harder for them to come, you know, relax and you know and and have sexual relations. You know, the other thing is, and I'll tell you something that I really geek out on is the microbiome. So, the microbiome is the bacteria that live in our gut, and there have been some amazing studies that are looking that if our gut microbiome is off there, it can cause inflammation in our body. And there's that feedback loop to the brain was when we're inflamed, once again, sex and stress can't coexist. And so they're finding that men, women, any, anybody, if their guts are off, there can be this feedback loop that will affect libido. So I'm really big too about like, let's be eat, making, eating more whole foods, try not to, you know, eat as many processed foods and sugars. And because of that connection with inflammation and, and even other disease states. So what about, um, the, the dangers of t testosterone in your experience? Because it's be the danger. <laughs> my, 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 you know, I it's a question that's written, that that's posed to me frequently, and I, and having you know discussed this with with Dr. Mohit Karen, who's made perhaps the, one of the most renowned testosterone experts in the United States, he doesn't see it. Um, yeah. And if you know if uh, you know if you get acne, just take just back off the dose. Um, so I, 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 you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but, but Dr. Link, uh, Melissa, what's been your experience? Do you think testosterone is dangerous? At what, at what level would you tell someone to back off if they're assuming they're injecting it? 
Yeah, I think, you know, my biggest thing is trying to stay within the normal, like keeping the testosterone within the normal range. Now, everybody has their normal range, but we also want to try to keep it in the laboratory range. Where I see it a problem is um, any hormone that you give, if it becomes, if it's a steady state for too long, the body tunes it out. So then with testosterone, because people tend to feel really good on it, I see people almost getting overdosed on testosterone where they'll be like, oh, it doesn't work or it wasn't working as well. So then they get more and then they're like, oh, it's not, I was feeling good and then wasn't working. And so they get more and they're just keeping getting more. Nobody's checking their levels. So I get concerned when people are coming in and their like levels are three to four times that of normal range. Like I want to keep them as much in the normal range. And so as long as it's, you know, within that, and we're using, you know, more of the bioidentical hormones, as opposed to like some of the non bioidentical hormones are, are a little bit more inflammatory. So that's more of an issue. So it, as long as someone's being monitored and keeping within normal range, and here's a, here's a trick. Like I have people like, let's say for example, they're getting hormone pellets. Well, that's going to be at a steady state because pellets are implanted under the skin. They take about three months to absorb. Um, just because three months have gone by, I don't necessarily put another pellet in right away at three months. Sometimes we'll try to push it four months, five months to help keep the receptor sensitive. Or if someone's doing like a daily topical testosterone, maybe they'll do it during the week and then take the weekends off. Just, I mean, when you apply something topically, you get a normal up and down. But, you know, as long as we keep the receptor sensitive and you're staying in normal range, it's really, there's not like a danger of... So are you, um, are you recommending people inject once a week, twice a week, three times a week? Yeah, it depends on, because it depends on the, uh, on the form they're getting. So some of them are daily forms. So there's, you know, I, I prefer the shorter acting hormones than the longer acting ones, because I want that up and down to keep their receptors more sensitive. Okay. So like, you know, there's like testosterone uh, undokinate is like a 12 week injection. Well, then, you know, at 12 weeks, I wouldn't necessarily do another injection. Like if you're using a long acting um, testosterone, I would try to go push it like a little bit longer so we could keep recept the receptor sensitive. Okay. So well, let me, uh, we have, a, we have a lot of questions that we want to answer eventually, but I want to switch to, Mo to Melissa right now. Yeah. I, I guess Dr. Perlman couldn't, couldn't join us. I, I really want to find out now that she's gone from an academic conventional urology practice to a concierge practice, how her assessment and management uh, of, of patients with erectile dysfunction, just fr oh, frankly, men going through the mm -hmm. A lot of men, uh, and I would say this is my case uh, is I'm on, I don't you know have ED but I do want I don't want to deteriorate. We you know we're all all of us men and women are on a uh, a path from fitness to dysfunction and we'd like to stop where we are. If we have a problem, we'd like to re reverse course. So don't want to continue to deteriorate. So and and so I, I'm I'll have up to of you, Melissa. Little Betsy, feel feel free to chime in. Yeah. Um, you. Your practice is special, Melissa. So, how, what's changed, what's new for you in terms of the assessment and management um, of AD uh, function? Provoke, yeah, prevent, so, treatment. Hmm. I think the most important thing with when it comes to AD, whether it's being caused by prostate cancer treatment or aging or medication or whatever, is just really looking at your lifestyle factors. So I think, you know, if you're overweight and you've got a big fat belly, you're basically stopping all the blood flow getting to your penis and to your pelvis. So you really need to, to think about those things that sound really basic. And I think if there's ever been a reason for a man to worry about his weight, other than the fact he just wants to wear nice pants or something, it's definitely the, the motivation to get your erections working better has got to be a good one. So I think we should be advertising that as motivation. There's also that really fun stat that for every 16 kilos, which I'm not sure how much that is in pounds, a man loses, he gains one and a half centimetres of his penis length back. So I think that's pretty encouraging. But exercise to get blood pumping down in your pelvis and eating good, healthy foods with lots of fruit and vegetables and antioxidants in them and good quality protein and making sure that you make, like lower your belly fat because if you have high belly fat, you have high estrogen and you also have binding globulins which will bind to your testosterone. So what I often see is men who come in whose libido is low and they have ED and they want their testosterone checked because they think this is the magic pill that's going to fix everything and they're sitting there with 
a big fat gut and you get, take their testosterone level and you go, actually, you are producing a lot of testosterone, but it's all bound up with your binding goblin. And if you just lost some weight, that would make a massive difference. And interestingly, I had a telehealth conference yesterday with a guy who um, is only young, he's only 38, and he's been struggling with erectile dysfunction for a couple of years and tablets aren't working, so I've taught him how to do injections. And I've been nagging him about losing weight and he's been ignoring me and stopping smoking. And then he's got on to a lady who sells some sort of herbal supplement in America that's supposed to detox his body and suddenly his erections are back. But whilst he's been taking this herbal supplement, he's also been following a very strict diet regime and exercising every day. So I suspect that the herbal supplement probably has nothing to do with it and it's his lifestyle changes. So I think that's number one in ED rather than, you know, dealing with a tablet. I think the second thing is thinking about blood flow in general, like making sure people have cardiovascular check because your penis is like the canary down the mine shaft. And if, you know, that's starting to fail you, then you want to make sure that your heart isn't next because if those small arteries are getting blocked to your penis, they're probably also getting blocked to your heart. And also your mental health because, you know, if you have high cortisol levels, it reduces your uh, increases your inflammation and it reduces your erectile function. So I think all of those things uh, have always been important, but they're increasingly more obvious now. And then we need to move on to the next step, which is obviously trying PDE5 medications such as Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Spedra. I think you call it Spendra in America. With a Spendra, um, yeah. Stendra. And there's a new drug that's um, coming on the market. I don't know if you've heard of, which I'm really excited about. It's called Spontane. Have you heard about Spontane mm -hmm. over there? So it's a worldwide patent owned by an Australian company and it will be Vardenafil, which is the key ingredient in Levitra, but it's nasal delivery. So instead of it taking an hour to work, it will only take 15 minutes. Um, and that's just released at the moment in Australia. I think I can prescribe it and one other person for the next three months and then it will be... Um, open slather and I think that's really exciting because the side effects in that study showed less for gastrointestinal side effects and um, really good delivery and then I think the other thing about erectile function is just talking through with people all the options like if you're losing your nocturnal erections then you really need to do something about it and I think that's how I got involved with Elliot and Ann is that like for years I've been saying to patients, are you having nocturnal erections? They're like, oh, I'm not sure. And so it's an absolute game changer for me that I can say to people, if you wear this for a couple of weeks and then let's, you know, back off on this tablet that you're taking and see what changes. Let's see if you're not having any alcohol at night time, what changes with your nocturnal erections. You know, your smooth muscle needs exercise, you're getting those nocturnal erections, then your penis is healthy. So I think often we don't know what affects people until we can measure it objectively. And now we can. That's made a massive difference in my practice in assessing what is causing someone's ED. And um, I know I've told you this, Elliot, but my husband had an operation last year and I had him wearing the tech ring for two weeks without taking daily Tadadafil. My husband's in his early 60s. He was having one erection a night. I started him on daily Tadadafil. He was having five to six a night and then he went in and had leg surgery and he was on opioids for two weeks for the pain. No erections for the two weeks he was on the opioids and two weeks, uh, two weeks after. Mm. So having erections with stimulation but not with nocturnal erections anymore. And I think, you know, if, you, if he wasn't wearing that, we wouldn't know that. And then you think about how many people are on long-term medication that might be affecting their sexual function and they're not even considering it. So I think the biggest thing in my day-to-day -day assessment that has changed is using that ring because it really enables me to be able to figure out what's going on instead of just sticking a Band-Aid on the problem. That's, I mean, that's great to hear. And certainly what we hear, well, two several things. Our goal with the tech ring is to give people objective, actionable, but personal data. You know, one of the, one of, one of the ways in which... I'll speak for Betsy and myself. I'll actually speak for myself. We doctors are assholes, just generically. We treat everyone as if they're one size fits all. And if all four people on the screen right now, different weights, different ages, different genders, if we told the psych psychiatrist or I found like, Dr. G, I'm depressed, they person the same dose of medication. If we have high blood pressure, 
they would go through the same sequence, probably which would involve a beta, a beta blocker. Uh, and, and we all respond differently to those things. And, the, and but then by giving people individual data, you can actually, people can actually say, well, what works, what doesn't work for me might, work, might not work for someone else. Um, so uh, the, I like to circle back to the tablets though, because that, that's, um, that's where men go first. Uh, in the United States, they're, they're readily accessible online. And, and I do have some concerns. I have no problem with someone who's 30 years old and has performance anxiety, probably, um, you know, going online and getting any pills. I do have a problem with someone my age using that, as, you know, going to a teledoc and using that as a first line therapy because they could be masking a cardiovascular problem. Yeah. Or, or a significant medication you know, so, you know, side effect. Uh, if you go back to the original Viagra papers, you know, it's only 20% more effective than placebo. Now, placebo effect is really, really powerful. I, and that was interesting, uh, Melissa, that you mentioned your husband recovered his nocturnal erections um, on, you know, you know, while he was taking to Dalafil, but he was post-op. His special situation, I wonder if that would be the case today. I, want, I wonder if today, if, if he wasn't in a special situation, whether it's a Dalafil would, you know, would, would benefit him. Not, I, I got guys who tell me the Dalafil works well, it's in their wallet. Uh, in fact, I can tell me it works well in the night. <laughs> so, and I, and I, and I have, you know, as I've shared with you, Melissa, previously, if you went to my, you know, in my, our bathroom, there are eight supplements that I take. I don't think, I think only one, I think only one really works is vitamin D3. Uh, and um, my personal experience with the Dalafil has been uh, that has no impact unless I'm drinking. If, if I, if I, um, Cause I, uh, you know, I have to ring. So I, I got, I got, got to pretend I'm Louis Pasteur of human sexuality. Um, if I'm drunk or not, let me put it down, I don't, I don't ever get drunk. If, but if I've had three or four cocktails, I have no nocturnal erections over the week. On the other hand, if I take 10 Hadalafil, they, you know, you know, they recover. So, uh, that's now, there's a question, sorry, in there, which is a, Guy Stephen asking that he's been on hormone treatment for prostate cancer for 18 months and will his sex drive return naturally or shall he have testosterone supplements? Um, the answer to that, Stephen, is that it depends when you last had your testosterone lowering medication and then how long that takes to work out of your body. But in my experience, if you're not, some people are permanently on that medication, like on a monthly or three monthly injection. And if that's the case, you can't have testosterone supplements and it won't return naturally. But if you stop it, then yes, over time, your testosterone, natural testosterone levels can improve with exercise and a healthy diet. And the idea is just to keep an eye on that. And I don't know if in America, but in Australia, I know that um, the urologists and the endocrinologists are happy to prescribe testosterone supplements 12 months after prostate cancer treatment if the person is having, um, you know, like sad mood or having serious side effects from not having enough testosterone. So I don't think it's the flat no that it used to be. And there's certainly a lot of movement forward in that area. And I think we really need to concentrate on people's quality of life. But you certainly wouldn't go straight out and prescribe, replace the testosterone. You would wait and see what happened and monitor that. Is that what happens in America? Yeah. And in fact, um, you know, and I know like some people f are always worried about cancer with hormones. However, the, the studies that have been out there, there's no, they, you have some studies that say, yes, potentially there's a higher rate of prostate and there's some that say no. And so the consensus is we don't really know. And we don't really think that it's related to the hormones itself. So, mm. um, you know, and I always tell people when it comes like, with cancer in general, like we make cancer cells all the time in our bodies. And that majority of the time our bodies take care of it with our immune system. And every once in a while one gets through and you know, now we're, we're where we're at, but it's, um, the hormones, I don't look at the hormones, not that they're causing the cancer, but if you have a, a cancer that is hormone receptor positive, sometimes it can feed it, but this is why it's so important to just keep getting normal, your normal screening. But I don't worry about yeah, I don't typically worry about the hormones when it comes to um, cancers and people. So I was, I sort of the analogy I use to explain it to patients for those listening is, you know, if you had a pot of soil and you put a seed in it, and then you put fertilizer in it, the seed would grow. But if you had a pot of soil, you never put the seed in, and you poured the fertilizer on it, nothing's going to grow. Yeah, so exactly. I think that's a, that I'm stealing that. That's good. 
<laughs> I think it's the same with hormones and cancer. You yeah. know, so it's if you can think about it like that, I think that kind of helps make make it make a bit of sense. I, I discussed this well with some of the leading experts in the United States, and they they, they feel that's it's fine to continue with testosterone yeah. therapy mm. before and 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 during and, and during during recovery. Yeah. Yes, Stevens just replied again. So. Yeah. Well, I, uh, yes. So, Stephen, if you can cease that, then yes, over the next twelve months, you'd like to hope that things would return. But you need to do some weight bearing exercise. Go and lift some weights, push right. some iron. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to say I, I just want to mention my, my personal experience with testosterone, um, which was interesting because um, the urologist that I spoke with predicted that I'd have more nocturnals and they'd last longer, uh, and that was not the case. But I think in terms of the andropause and overall benefit to men. Uh, I can take it because my upper body strength increased by 7% without pushing it. Uh, and so I feel, and I also feel better too, but I feel better is subjective. I have some wife about that. I guess I can be irritable sometimes. Maybe, maybe I also need some oxytocin to, 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 to balance it. But I think testosterone for men going through endoports, I think that should be the standard of care. Um, yeah. 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 I do, interestingly enough, um, I don't know if you both know, but in Australia, we have the only TGA-approved version of testosterone for women, um, which is made oh, by... that's nice. And, and we can actually prescribe it. I know it's quite difficult for you guys, but we have We a prescribe called, it, but it's compounded. We don't have any... You, you can't... And then there's no insurance coverage for women. Yeah. yeah. So we do. We have a product called Androfem, which was invented by a West Australian doctor, actually. It's really good. So, yeah. Brilliant. I'm all for women having testosterone too. I mean... God, we don't all need to be weak and saggy and, yeah, I think it's an amazing hormone. I sort of feel like nowadays we're living so much older and, you know, we need to be functioning at 70 like we were at 40, so we should be helping ourselves. Yeah. Let's just, I'd like to just circle back to um, the shock therapy for a moment because, yeah. you know, Suleiman couldn't, couldn't join us. Um, but where's – and I, I have very little – I've not done it personally um, – but I, we have quite a few men using our, our the tech ring who are and they're and they're using it uh, to screen themselves beforehand or to monitor, monitor therapy. In other words, if they if they if they don't have nocturnal erections, it's highly unlikely that they're going to benefit from shockwave therapy. Uh, if if they are getting shockwave therapy, they can they can monitor its progress. What's been your experience, Melissa and Betsy, uh, with shockwave therapy? I love it. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> So Melissa, if you want to answer that first. And then... No, you go first, Betsy. I'd uh, like to hear. Uh, so, yeah, so I, it, shockwave therapy is fun. Um, so the idea with shockwave therapy is it's using sound waves to basically cause a mechanical disruption in the tissue. And the idea, if there's micro plaques in the blood vessels, it's that shockwave that's going and kind of breaking it up. Um, there's also some theories about it causing um, neovascularization. So the formation of new blood vessels in the tissue to all aid in blood flow. Um, but I'm going to just also reiterate, like anybody that's ever walked into my clinic for shockwave therapy, if they're having erectile dysfunction, like that is, an, and I know Elliot, you and I have had this conversation about that. That's an early warning sign for cardiovascular disease. So I get every single one of those patients to go for, um, to see a cardiologist because, you know, people don't necessarily connect their penis with their heart all the time. And so it's so important because that's like the early warning sign where the body's going, Hey, I'm trying to get your attention and I don't know how to do that. So I'm going to give you problems with your penis. So when that's happening, you need to get with a cardiologist. So, and, um, and interesting enough, and the cardiologists are sending me a lot of patients for that erectile dis, you know, dysfunction with the, with the uh, shock wave. So it's, it's a, you know, once again, this is a tool in our tool belt, you know, not any, you know, not every single treatment is going to be that magic pill that's going to cure everybody, but, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it works well, it can work well in certain individuals. Um, the idea is, and I find that most people, you know, tolerate the procedure pretty well. Um, you basically you come in and we, we shockwave the penis and then, you know, there's different protocols where you, you do it like twice a week, twice, you know, for a couple of weeks. And then there's protocols where you even keep up with a maintenance, uh, potentially, but it, it works also in, when you combine it with other therapies. So if you combine 
combine it with a penis pump, you're going to get a better result than if you're just doing a penis pump by itself or you're just doing a shockwave by itself. Um, sometimes we'll also combine it with PRP injections. So that's where we're taking blood, your own blood, and spinning it down and taking out the platelet-rich plasma and using the growth factors in the platelet-rich plasma, injecting that into the penis to also help with the stimulation of um, new blood vessels. But, so, but tonight, uh, Bo Bucket just asked an interesting question, which I can't answer. He says, is there a scientific study to compare the effectiveness of focused shockwave ah, therapy? Yes. Therapy? Yes. So, yes. That's all right. <laughs> this is the big <laughs> debate. Yes. yes so. This is the big debate focused shockwave versus ra radial. Okay. So, let me talk about focused shockwave is when the sound waves come out of the machine, they're, they start wide and they focus down, down smaller. There are more studies at right now showing focus shockwave being being better because it's it was older technology, so we have more studies. I will tell you the focus shockwave does hurt a lot more than the radial. Um, so the radial shockwaves they come out thin and they spread out wide, and so that the radial shockwaves can typically be done without numbing medicine, where the focus usually so. Right now, we're we're kind of we're hoping that the radial um, we're hoping that the radial uh, studies start picking up, and that we're hoping that they'll show that it's just as good. I think there's one study that shows that it's it's equivalent, but where we are now, just because the focus is has been around longer, there's more studies supporting focus than there is necessarily radial. But, um, but I will tell you from personal experience, um, I, having done both, I, I tend to lean towards the radials cause it seems to be working perfectly fine and it's a lot more comfortable. So, and I will tell you having experience with actually getting focused on my elbow cause we use it for pain. We use it for like, uh, we use it for like different, um, like I had tennis elbow and I had the focus done on my elbow. It was it was it was really uncomfortable. So given the choice, I think I would rather have radial. <laughs> but yeah, right now officially, it's the focus is supposed to be the better one. But yeah, well, we don't know. So. We, yeah, there's just not enough, you know, research, and there's not really a lot. There's not enough, and you know that this is where things come up too when it comes to research. You know, you have to realize. There's a lot of things I would love to study and love to see studies on, but some things are just not research dollars to support. Mm. So this is why you we won't ever see giant randomized controlled studies on bioidentical hormones because you can't naturally you you can't patent anything that occurs naturally in the body. So there's no research dollars in bio bioidentical hormones. So we're never going to see those big studies. So. Yeah, well, and the, and there's a lot of money to be made by people who are involved in the focused industry. They don't. I yeah. Don't think, you know, yeah. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Um, I like I don't do shockwave, but I send my patients to a physio that I work with to do it, and I've noticed that post prostatectomy, the patients who have waited until eighteen months, two years, seem to get a better response, and that's purely anecdotal. So I'm curious mm -hmm. on your opinion on that. And then also I'm really interested in the at-home shockwave therapy and I've been watching that space closely because in Western Australia we have one physio who does low-intensity shockwave and also, you know, it's a bit of a hike for people to get there and I feel like if the at-home ones are, are good, I think that would just be a game-changer because my attitude is is throw everything at it as long as it's not going to cause harm and see what happens because different things work for different people. Um, so I'd really like to know both of your experience about that. And there's also someone in the chat who's asked about um, infrared light and penile area stimulation. I can answer that after if anyone wants well, to. Well, you know, um, that's why I want uh, Suleiman here because he, he is one of the two American companies uh, that are in this space. Uh, you know, the other company is... is, is Launch medical, and they make the Phoenix. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I, I think, I mean, anecdotally, pe people report to me that, that it works, but I would, I'd love to have a pre and post objective firm tech erectile fitness score. That would be amazing. Because uh, it, it would, and, and I'm hoping to 
get that study either with 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 uh, with, with uh, Suleiman or, or with Launch Medical, um, because it, there's no reason people to go to a doc, you know. Of course, Gainsway wants to hold on to this and, as, as as something that's done in the office. There's a lot of money made by doctors, and and uh, but it'd be great to think to find out could this be done at home and be done, be done effectively. And I mean, the I know the Launch Medical machine is equivalent to the stores. You know, which, which which use commonly. So I don't. It should work, Melissa. I just don't. I just, I'd like to. See, I'd like to see the data, and I'd like to see actual pre pre and post because so much of uh, erectile dysfunction right now is graded with subjective scoring systems. Yes. Uh, and you know, there's a paper presented at the American Rally Association com comparing our objective erectile fitness score with the SHIM and the IET, and, and basically showing that they're inferior, which you'd expect because that you know they're they're not they're not objective. Yeah, I agree with you. I, you know, I'm just going to agree with you. And, um, you know, oh, I know Melissa wants to talk more about the red light, but I, I also like red light. Like throw that in, throw that in. Too. <laughs> okay, well, um, I, I have personal red light experience, but so go, go ahead. Yeah. Experience. Well, it's interesting. I feel as though there's, I've read the studies and the studies are a bit wishy-washy, but again, I'm all for trying, you know, if we all waited until amazing randomised control trials came out to do anything, we'd never do anything and we'd be 10 years behind the eight ball. So I think if something's not going to do harm, let's give it a go. And it has shown that red light therapy does a lot of good work for, you know, collagen production in skin, you know, in your face. So it, to me, it's just logical that it would then be good for your penile tissue as well. So I think it's about applying a bit of logic to it. Um, there's this awesome pump that a, I was telling you about, Betsy, before we came on the website, that a cosmetic surgeon in Western Australia has invented, and it's called the TheraPump. And if anyone wants to know about them, I've done a heap of YouTube videos on these pumps, and I've got them on my website. But they, I call them the disco for your dick pump. They, <laughs> um, they're automatic. They like come like this, but they have a red light in the cylinder. So you put it on and you're doing your pumping exercise for like to get the smooth muscle exercised. And at the same time, the red light therapy is going into the penis tissues. Um, so they're great fun. They're awesome. When I do presentations, I turn the lights off and everyone gets a good laugh. But they also, you know, I, I think that there is if you've got nothing to lose, why wouldn't you try it? And, you know, it makes sense for all the rest of the skin and the penile tissue skin is so sensitive why wouldn't it make sense? So, yeah, yeah. I, I just think it, it sounds like a great idea and let's give it a go. And I'm all about combination therapy. So throw the more things you throw at something, the, the better. So, you know, the, the idea with the red light is that we know that the wavelengths of red light um, – that the range of the, the wavelengths can stimulate the mitochondria. We know that the mitochondria is that powerhouse is that anti-aging factory of the cells. So they've been using red light for cosmetic purposes for years. And so it's fun to see that they're using it for like skin rejuvenation for the face and for hair growth. Um, which, you know, we see, you know, two as men, men are, are aging, they're starting to lose their hair. Women are starting to lose their hair. We know that it'll stimulate the hair follicles. And so now it's so fun to see them apply these, this red light technology to pelvic health with like, I, I can't wait to check out that, that pump for, for men. Cause I want to, I want to get that one on my store and then I'll uh, post you one. Yeah. <laughs> and then within, then they make, they make wands, red light wands for women too. So I, you know, my, my husband laughs at me. I have a whole face one that I put on every night. And so, like. Do you have a lingerie to match it? I know, right? And I do actually, the company that makes the red one for the vagina, I should be, like, having that. will be all glowing, you know, from <laughs> top to bottom. And actually, one of my secret desires is for my clinic is they sell red light beds where it's almost like a tanning booth. And you can get in from head to toe. And I'm like, I want one of those. That's on my, my list of, that's on my wish list. I want one of those. So. Well, well, again, getting back to kind of a theme at, at, at FirmTech is people want objective, actionable, actionable personal, you know, data. I From, love that. Yeah. Personal, and, I, and I have no problem with heart, trying anything that I think is benign, but I will say with testosterone, which is going to try, I did try it, but there's a company in Los Angeles that has a, that gave me their red light product while it was um, in seed, while it was in beta rather, excuse me. 
uh, and I used it for for two months, um, and my sperm count went down because one of the claims of the sperm count would go up, and also my erect they had no impact on my, the hardness of my erections, and my no, no, nocturnals on average went down from four to three. Mm. I don't know if that's significant or not, but again, I don't have I don't have an ED, so maybe you know what, what does it, what does it mean? So I agree, you know, I, I think. You don't want to get in a situation where you're taking so many things you can't sort out what's working, what's not working. Yeah. The thing about having data is that you can then say, I mean, think about Brian Johnson taking 181 pills a day. Well, maybe only five of them are beneficial, but if, with, 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 if you have a tool for data, you can actually isolate things and say, well, I'll try this, I'll try this. And I, and by the way, Bessie, I think your point about combination therapy is probably true. I mean, I mean we at FirmTech have not seen any benefit from taking a a single oral um, male supplement enhancer. I'm, I'm thinking L-arginine, yeah, EGA, citrulline, citrulline uh, maca root, horny goat weed, all these things. There is a paper, there is a doctor right now, I don't, and I have an MDA with him, so I don't want to blow, blow what he's doing, but he's, he's, using, he's using a combination therapy pill, uh, and I, I, I've seen the anonymous data, and it's, it's positive for, for, for uh, combination therapy. With three of those things and that paper will publish in the fall and i'm excited about it because uh there's a lot of you know the, the this nature circle industry is a multi multi-billion dollar industry and there's there uh well i think a lot of the things that they're doing are benign and are, for one i take them it'd be great to find out well some what really works yeah yeah i use um some herbal supplements in my practice larginine lacarotine and curcumin Mm -hmm. um, and there is some good evidence around those, and I particularly use them for people who are doing penile rehab after prostate cancer treatment and don't want to take PDE5 medications. And, again, I mean, they're not doing any harm and, you know, people report that they have better blood flow. So I think, you know, you, you can't be doing, as long as you're not doing harm, what's, you may as well give something a go. You know, I was thinking, though, as a practitioner, I would love for you to take your device and do a study with the the radial versus the uh, focus shock wave, because I really want that answered. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, you know, I was thinking like, oh, stores, they have both machines. That would be easy. But I'm like, they might not as a company might not want you <laughs> to do those studies. They might not want to show that one works better than the other. But um because they're selling both machines, but you know, my, yeah, I think it would help them market it their machines better. You know, if they if you mm -hmm. had that data, that'd be br brilliant. Well, it's great when it, when it comes to objective because we we have yeah. men point to us. Gee, I um a twenty mil to twenty milligrams of dalafil is no different for me than five. So yeah. why would I take twenty? So you know, and and, um, and, and pharma loves me too as well too. I and I also from personal personalization, you, like you were talking about a medicine, like if you can be wearing this and showing that, hey, this is working for me. Yeah, why not? So I think also just because, you know, PDE5 medications, different ones work better for different people. Yeah. And so yeah, and why. that, you know, so some people, you know, will get a great erection with Viagra, but the others won't work and vice versa. And you know, I think that can be just because they might have food in their stomach that day or whatever, but it mm -hmm. can also be that their body composition doesn't respond as well. So, like, if people have a firm tech ring, then, you know, it's always a, a good way to objectively measure that and go, actually, you know, Tadadafil does work better for me than Sildenafil or, you know, all these, these things work. And then you are not having such a hit and miss thing. I was thinking okay. also... Sorry, you go. We, I would also just like to mention this in the use of climacteria after prostate cancer because there's lots of questions in there about prostate cancer. But sorry, Elliot, you go. No, go ahead. You finish with that. But I want, I want to, I want to focus on the neglected stepchild of the vascular system, which is the venous, venous circulation. But finish up, make your point about climacteria. Um, I was just also, so there's quite a lot of people in there, obviously, that have had prostate cancer treatment. And one of the biggest um, problems with that is climacteria and arousal leakage. And in the past, my solution to that has been sending people for sling surgery or um, using a normal cock ring that will, like, you know, obviously block off your urethra. Everyone who doesn't know, this is Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just that your urethra runs really close to the surface and it's easy to block it. The problem with that is if you have a really tight cock ring on, 
you're blocking the blood flow in and out of the shaft of the penis, which means it's cold and blue to touch. And as a woman, it's a little bit off-putting um, and it's not, you know, getting any better than it was. So what I have found with this, and I did send 50 of these out to my patients, I only got 13 people fill out the paperwork, right? And I put an abstract in for the next conference presenting it. But these are awesome for climacteria. So this is the Max Pro, the FirmTech Max Pro, and that it just is just firm enough to block off this urethra to stop that arousal leakage if men put it on when they're semi-erect and they'll still continue to fill up their erection. So if you have got arousal leakage or um, climacteria, this is definitely a bit of a game changer for me because I've like, especially for wives, like even though, you know, urine sterile, sterile and there's no issue with it, it is off-putting. So, yeah, I just think that's a, a really great thing for all post-prostate cancer men to try. Uh, I, I want to, there's a couple of questions I want to ask, uh, answer here. Um, one is uh, about the impact of TERPs. Certainly what, what we hear from our, our, our patients is, is that TERP has, TERPs lead to, lead to retail, erectile dysfunction. Another one, gentleman is asking, um, how will ejaculation change the FirmTech measurements? It doesn't. Uh, we actually can record um, for study purposes every little twitch of the of the ejaculation. Um, we stop showing it because we don't know what it means. Meaning we don't we don't whether someone has seven or four. Or we just you know whereas we know that um, the seven number not four seven or four ejaculatory contractions of the, of the urethra. Oh. We we know that that the um, the nocturnal erections are the number in case cardiovascular disease. We don't know what the significance is of variable number of ejaculatory contractions, uh, so we just smooth it out in, in, in the graph. But I want I want to I want to now move to the Venus slide. I'm, I'm one of my you know, uh, you know years ago when I when I when I was uh, in medical school and a resident, I realized that pretty much everything in the body other than the brain is plumbing. It was much easier to think about things in terms of plumbing, uh, and so we you know and especially with the penis. So we have blood that needs to go in. Well, one, th one thing that frustrates me coming at urology from a non emergency medicine physician is the, pa the, the papers, the research groups together men who can't attain an erection, the men who can't sustain an erection. And these mm, are very, very different groups of men. I mean, a man who can't attain an erection, he's not even benefit PD5 medication. He's not gonna benefit from shock therapy. That man has a significant um, problem and, and, and needs to see cardiologists and, and urologists in order to have, have that addressed. Most men's problem, especially common as they get older, is that they can't sustain erection. Now, maybe when they were younger, it was due to anxiety. Um, but when they get older, um, the other issues enter into it. So we, so we talked before about things that can decrease blood flow to the penis, uh, calcifications in the microvasculature, due to diabetes, due to hypertension, due to atherosclerosis. But we also have a weakening of uh, the venous side as well, too, the muscles. That, that hold the blood in the penis or the, uh, don't work as well as you get older. They don't work as well in women, women either. Um, I think on the, just to, to digress on the female side, we attribute um, dr dryness in women, postman poles in women to hormone issues. And that's certainly a problem, but it's a vascular issue as well too. Uh, and the same, the same so with men, um, as, as you know, you know I, I'm sitting next to my wife here, you know, we first met uh, when she was, I don't know, 20 years old, I can, I can get an erection just by holding her hand and it'll last for a long time. That just doesn't happen anymore. Um, still turns me on, but doesn't, th th you know, it, it doesn't happen. So just the way our ankles swell more as we get older, our rings get tighter if we're, if we're holding it in the, our hands in a dependent position. We don't hold blood in our penis, penis as well. And this is where this, you know, I, I wasn't thinking about this before I got involved, before I got involved with tech ring. And then it quickly became apparent to me that every, every erection, a successful erection that has you know, ends in a wonderful climax, or a failed erection. Some man gets an erection, and loses it, whether it's due to anxiety, medications, disease, etc. Every erection ends in a venous leak. Every erection ends with blood moving out on, on the venous side, uh, and a ring is the solution, a comfortable ring. Uh, and I can't really emphasize that more. And granted, I'm self-serving. I have a company that does this, but the to, to, to move rings from these hard silicone rings to, to comfortable rings made out of elastoma that can be worn for hours is to change one men's ability, especially older men, to sustain erection comfortably 
to have to feel confident because so much of sex for men and women is really about confidence. Uh, and so I think the you know the ring is valuable rings are valuable for data, but they're also a mechanical solution. And I will say, Melissa, I, 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 there are cheaper ones than ours. Um, mm -hmm. the, I'm, I think the lasso ring is an, is an effective solution. Lasso style ring is, a, is an effective solution. It's probably the only non ring that we don't make that uh, is, is, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lower cost alternative. I think they're, they're not just our rings, but if men are looking for a, a solution that costs less than ours, mm. that, would be, that would be the way I to go. I think um, these are particularly good for the vascular leak because they're like reducing the vascular blood flow back, but they're still letting that arterial blood flow right. in. That's correct. And, and the other time that I find these great, sorry, is positional, positional yes. erectile dysfunction. They're great for that. Can you, can you, can you explain what it is you're holding, please? Yeah, so that one is the um, Max Pro, and it looks a bit like a sw black swan, doesn't it? Um, and, yeah, so these, I think they're great for, I have a lot of patients tell me, oh, I can maintain my erection if I'm standing, but as soon as I lay down, I can't anymore. Well, straight away you know that you've got a venous leak you're dealing with. So you just tell them, you know, when you're doing your foreplay and it's up and nice when you're standing, pop one of these on and then you'll be able to change position because, you know, it gets a bit boring doing it the same way all the time. So, um, you know, I think for that positional issue, these are really good as well. And from a woman's perspective, you know, a normal lasso, which, you know, I do use if I offer a cheaper option, they're fine, but you do get that lack of, you get the change in colour and the temperature of the penis, but also from a woman, they're hard. They're made out of something really hard, whereas if from a female perspective, this is much softer and more comfortable. So, you know, it, yes, they're more expensive, but, like, I haven't had any trouble selling these to patients because they feel the two and are just like, oh, it's worth the difference, you know, because they're comfortable. Well, uh, 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 Robert Pfaff is complaining that we're not focusing enough on, on, on men. Uh, on <laughs> on, on too, women. I'm, we're too much on women and not enough on men. And that uh, I could talk about for hours because that's actually <laughs> my, that's actually specifically my training as women, uh, he, but I just happened to, to get into the men's health. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't yeah. feel like we talked about women at all, had we? No, we did not. No, no. I, said, he meant, he said, I, I, I was just reading it at, 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 at a distance. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, I have to say, well, uh, just to do one thing, one really interesting thing about women just in, in sex as we eat, the, um, the old Masters and Johnson's um, graph of sexuality does not apply to women. So it's a very linear graph where we get like desire, arousal, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. But when when Masters and Johnson's came up with that, it was it was great. It was, you know, it was perfect. Like we didn't have anything else. But I like to show my patients the um, Rosemary Bassan model of sexuality for women. That's a bunch of intersecting circles. And so, um, you know, women's sexual function is actually a lot more complicated than men. So I think sometimes, you know, it made it a little bit easier to talk about men here, but, um, you know, with the Rosemary Bassan model, which I find is very interesting is I'll get women that come into the clinic and they're like, I'm having problems with my libido. And they, you know, they too think, well, give me hormones. And that's the answer when it was, you know, I, I try to refer back to your brain is your biggest, you know, sex organ that we need to find things that stimulate our brain and everybody's brain is different. But in the Rosemary Bassan model, she has desire not being first. Though spontaneous desire can still happen. It's just as we age, it's not happening as frequently. And the longer you're in a relationship, it tends not to happen as frequently because, um, you kind of get used to that partner. It's spontaneity and novelty that keeps that those dopamine bursts in the brain that make things exciting. So you got to kind of keep figuring out, you know, between you and the part and your partner, what things are like new and interesting. And you got to keep that spark alive. But in the Rosemary Bassan model, she says, just going through steps of in being open to sex can stimulate that sexual response. And I always tell my patients that that doesn't mean like go through steps and put up with something because if you're doing something and you're just not enjoying it, that's just going to make everything worse. But I say, you know, have a conversation with your partner. Like let's, 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 
you know, have a, a sex date. Let's try to do some things. And if it's not working, we stop. And if it doesn't, then we keep going on. And so in her model, she shows that just going through the steps will actually start stimulating blood flow to the pelvis, which can add to lubrication, which can then add to um, arousal and more lubrication and then hopefully a satisfying sexual event. So I refer everybody to the, the Rosemary Bisson model for, for women with that. So we are working at a front tech on a female device called the critique. Um, but cause we want to deliver the same thing to women that we've delivered to men, which is a, 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 a comfortable, easy to wear pleasure enhancing, but at the same time tool it can be worn overnight or during sex that women can then measure the impact of diseases, medications, diet, self and exercise, all these things upon, upon the social performance. Cause I don't, as I said, we're all on this path from fitness to dysfunction, men and women, uh, and we need we need data in order to see where we are. Otherwise, we're kind of navigating blind. Yeah, and women can have erectile dysfunction too. It just shows up, you know, shows up a little bit differently. Theirs is with the clitoris or with or with sensitivity of the vulva, where there are erectile uh, tissue is. So, yeah, and that's what the clitique will be measuring: is that arousal. And the blood flow that we, that comes into those into the whole of the clitoris. Yeah, and, and as women age, they actually even can get a retraction of the blood vessels. So even when people go try to go on hormone therapy, they don't see the results because they really typically need hormone therapy applied directly to the area, not systemic taking like a pill because it just can't sometimes even get to the area because we don't have that proper blood flow because those, those blood vessels have retracted over time. And this is where they're actually, they are applying shockwave to women and red light. And, you know, women also have laser therapy or radio frequency or platelet rich plasma. All these procedures can be done to rejuvenate um, that tissue. It's use it or lose it for women as yes, well. Yes, yes, yes. Very important. So, okay. I'm so, I'm going to have to love and leave you all. It's been wonderful to chat, but I'm sorry I've got a back to back clinic starting and it'll be out of control. So I'd love to do this again sometime, and um, I'm just going to leave you to to it. Thank you so much. Thank nice you, much. Melissa. All right. See ya. Let's just see if there are any, any questions we haven't answered here. That are I saw one earlier, and then I uh, they were asking about PT one forty one. So I I can actually talk about that. So PT one forty one is a peptide that is used for sexual function. It also goes by the name br bremelanotide, which I tell you all to say 10 times fast <laughs> if you can. Um, it's actually prescription for it's a, the prescription drug is Vilesi for women. Um, it has not been officially approved for men in the United States, but you can get it as a um, through compounding pharmacies. And so it can be either an injectable medicine or a nasal spray. And so it affects a receptor called the melanocortin receptor, which is a really fascinating receptor that um, in the body that actually controls hunger, sex drive, and skin coloring. It's all on the same receptor. So there has been some um, improvement in sexual function and mood and libido with the use of PT-141 or bremelanotide. Um, the one problem with it is its most common side effect is nausea and vomiting. And so that's really kind of puts a hamper on the mood when you kind of, you know, cause it's a medicine that you do like within a half an hour of some sort of sexual activity, either, um, uh, you know, in, inhale it through the nose or inject it into uh, like a leg muscle. And then if you're nauseous, it's, it's kind of tough, but it tends to get better the more it's used, but that is another op that is another option. So, so we've have uh, purchased some and we will be testing it on ourselves soon. <laughs> we'll report, Eventually. <laughs> we'll, report, we'll report back to you. We'll post, we'll post uh, what we, what we think about it. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, I do see one that says the, the cabergoline for uh, yep. to slow down prolactin to help an anorgasmia. I don't. Oh, how did you make that come up there? That's interesting. Oh, um, I don't know. I just. Yeah, yeah, look at that. If you highlight it, it pops up there. So I do not personally have any experience using that medication. So um, unfortunately, I can't. I, you know, I 
can't make any comments specifically on that one. So, yeah. I actually, I asked Dr. Perlman about that as well as um, Dr. Hotelling is on, who's on our advisory board and both of them said it's, it, 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 it only works in the minority of people who, you know, who try it. I personally have no experience with it. And I, I think that's the biggest thing with any of these medicines or treatments. There's not one that works on everybody. So that's why, you know, we have, because there's so many factors that go into sex and sexual functioning, you know, anywhere from like mood and mindset to inflammation and stress. And so it's going to be, you know, I always tell patients like total wellness is like a three-legged stool, a body, mind, spirit. If we don't have everything you know, in balance, you know, things won't work. And then there's so many different factors that this is why sometimes medications work on some people, or sometimes they work like once and then they don't work the next time or, or different therapies. So, you know, it's, it's definitely an evolving field with a lot of options. So, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify something for, for Bobak who asked about the nocturnal erections uh, and ejaculation and the, and, if you, if a man, um, in our experience, the firm tech, if a man has an orgasm before he goes to bed, he will have one less nocturnal erection per night. Like, like a, so, it, uh, what what I meant is that the nocturnal erection does not does not affect the you know the the, the ejaculation does not affect the waveform as represented. So I misspoke earlier, and I, I want to correct that. Um, anyway, we need to uh, wrap it up, Betsy. Yeah, uh, this has been fun. I would love to do it again. Yeah, my, uh, you know, I wrap it up by saying, uh, use it or lose it. Um, yes. And, and also, playing playing for pleasure is important. Many people who are older have been you've been in a relationship for a long time. People have often got gotten out of the, out of the habit of making love, and I think to some degree you need to approach this the way you'd approach cooking a good meal or ex or, ex or exercise. You don't just go to the gym and say, ah, what am I, what am I, what do I do today? You have, you have a plan if you're going to, if you're going to get fit. And the same thing that you don't just go to the refrigerator and say, I'm going to cook great meal tonight. Oh, there's nothing in the refrigerator. Ah, oh, let's just have some leftovers. So I really, I advocate plan for pleasure. And yeah, I'm I'm big about scheduling it in. I mean, it doesn't sound spontaneous, but if you don't put some time, whether it's me time or couple time on the calendar, other things will creep in. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're going to be engaging in sex, but you're doing something for some togetherness during that time period. So if you'd like it. to uh, reach me personally, if anyone has had to have their questions answered, you can reach me at LLIOT at myfirmtech.com. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All right.